Before I begin, I want to thank you uh, for allowing me to come and share with you today for Ron's uh, invitation from myself and Jeanette to come to be with you. Um, I met Ron, I think it was back in 19... Uh, 40. Uh, 19... <laughs> 1991, <laughs> 1991, Padstow Church of Christ in Sydney. And then um, we happened just to, to link up again just a few months ago. Um, I recognise Ronnie hasn't changed much in all of those years. So <laughs> you're drinking a happy, happy water, Ron, because yeah. you stayed young. Now, over the years, uh, I think if you are like everyone else, you would find the life circumstances uh, a change, what you had thought would happen in your life or uh, things that you uh, were able to plan out probably did not necessarily work out the way that you had thought or there may be circumstances of life that come along which you had not even dreamt would happen and so your life might change and might take a slightly different direction or you have to make adjustments as you go through those circumstances and the situations of life. And I want to say that sometimes people think that God is like that. There is sometimes a false or incorrect understanding by some Christians regarding God's plan of salvation. In particular, there is a, a, a false understanding by many about when God decided to save us or what he planned to do. They seem to think that God developed his plan on the go. That after sin entered the world, God said, well, that was a mistake, what will I do now? And so he thought up his plan of salvation. You know, uh, that, that God reacts to the circumstances of humanity. Well, certainly God does uh, take our life situation into account and his grace responds to those situations. But some seem to think that God, God's plan of salvation was developed on the go. But that thinking would be incorrect. And I want to share with you today some things to help you realise that you in particular have been so important to God that God planned for your salvation before anything else was ever created, before time began. The scripture says that God had his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ before time began, before anything else was created. And I want to do some uh, Bible jumping around just to, in the New Testament. You can follow if you wish or I can read them to you and you can trust me. But uh, if you can read them in your own Bibles, that would also be helpful. In Titus chapter 1, I should say that I believe that the whole of the Word of God is inspired. Um, we believe that, I believe that over the many, many centuries that the Scripture was written, God brought to the minds of people who, who would not have even been around when some of these things occurred. But he brought to their mind his message of inspiration. The New Testament tells us that the prophets wrote down things sometimes that they didn't even understand, but they would just receive the message of God from inspiration. That's why I believe that under the writings of Paul and Peter and John and all of the other writers of the scriptures, we can hear the word of God to us because God has given them that message. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, he talks in, uh, in verse 1 about being a servant of God, your faith, uh, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, now listen to these words, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Before the ages began, God promised eternal life. Then we flick back to 1 Corinthians. Just, please excuse me for doing a bit of jumping around, uh, but this is only momentary. 1, John, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul writes, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, 
which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Then in Ephesians chapter 1, I love the book of Ephesians. There's so much there and so uh, many things. It talks about God's blessings. Ephesians 1, 4 says, Even as he chose us in him, now listen to the next words, before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. The significant words there are before the foundation of the world. Now I want to go on a little side. Some people say that God chose some people and didn't chose others. But that's not what those verses are saying. He chose that whoever would believe in Jesus Christ, those people, whoever would believe, though the offer is given to all, those people are predestined to be his children. God's plan was to make us his children. That is the predestination. Before the foundation of the earth, God predestined or he planned ahead that those who accepted Jesus Christ would be his children. God planned that before the foundation of the world. Then two chapters over in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 and 11, we have the same thing repeated. He says here in the middle of verse 9, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Then down in verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he realized has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in the last verse, I want to uh, get you to consider, uh, to, to uh, remember, is 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. We talk about the gospel by the power of God, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Have I made the point? God's plan for salvation to save you if you choose to believe and have faith, relationship with Jesus Christ, God's plan before time began, before anything else was ever created or existed, God's plan was to deal with sin, your sin and my sin, which God knew would happen, and to offer eternal life and eternal glory to us. Before anything else was created, before time began, through eternity, God had already planned to deal with our sin in Jesus Christ. Now some would say, well, why did God create us then? If he already knew that we would sin and he would have to save us, why bother to create us? Because that's at some great expense to God. Well, I think the answer to that is the character, grace, purity and depth of God's love are so great that God wanted to have eternal relationship with someone, with us. It's not God saying, I am so great, I am so holy, I am so pure. Look at me and worship me, aren't I wonderful? No, it's not that. It's not God's vanity, but it's God's generosity. God's grace and his love and his character of holiness was so great that God said, I need to love. I need to share my glory. To be generous. Not to be vain, but to be generous. And so God, even though he knew that sin would exist, God still created so that he could redeem us, make us his children, so that through eternity he could share those things with us. God's love is so great. And I really like that last song. I'd like to get a... Uh, get words and copy of that so I can take it back to our own congregation that we go to. 
You know, I want to stress this point. God created us so he could love us and share his glory. But he planned that before the ages began. It is a crucial element in understanding then that if God, God planned this before the ages began, he has been consistent in his repeated revelation of that plan and consistent in that revelation of himself since he planned it. His consistent revelation of himself so that we would learn and follow and ultimately see the climax of that plan in Jesus Christ. You know, until the last century, scientists believed that time was eternal. That if we went further and further and further and further back in time, we would never ever reach the start of time. We would never come to the start, to the beginning. But you know, in the 20th century, Einstein's theory of relativity and lately, the detection of cosmic background radiation. If you're a physicist, explain that to me later. <laughs> but it's basically saying that radiation exists in the universe, and by tracing how that radiation breaks down, we can go back and ultimately come to the start, to the beginning. Even now, physicists believe that there was a start of it all. But that's what the Bible's been saying all along. In the beginning, God created, because God was before the beginning. There was a moment, but even now I'm using the language of time, because when we talk of moments, we're talking about some period of time. But there was a moment when time, as we know it, did not exist. Time had a beginning when God started creation. Before that, there was simply God, eternal in existence, eternal in activity, always there, and Isaiah says, always unchanging. Way, 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 way back throughout eternity, there was always God. But then time began when God said, let it be, that he wanted to create out of nothing. So what does that mean for us? Because God has planned before time began, because God is all loving, because God wants to lead us to salvation, God will consistently and deliberately reveal himself to us. He will consistently and deliberately reveal his plan of salvation. And as we go through history, if we are clever enough, we can look back and see the continuation of, and the greater insights into the mind of God. We know that through the evidence of creation, he has revealed his existence and power. Romans chapter 1 says that. It says only fools would say there is no God because nature itself declares the existence of God. Through his relationship with people throughout history, people of believing response, he has shown greater understanding of his grace. Through the leaders and prophets and the life of the people of Israel, God has revealed more and more of his character and purpose. And ultimately, we read in the Gospel of John chapter 1, Ultimately, God brought it to a climax by revealing himself in the personal incarnation of Jesus Christ. The word became flesh, the statement of God, the expression of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so if Jesus is the climax of all that has been revealed, all that has been leading up to his coming, that's why Jesus said, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. Because he is the end of God's revelation. So as we look at the record of scripture, we'll be able to see statements of the gospel plan over and over and over again. It started back in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve sinned, and we know that uh, the... the uh, Genesis says that God used to walk in the garden and have fellowship with Adam and Eve. 
And after they'd sinned, God called out, where are you? The beginning of God's grace. He didn't go up and say, boom, saw you. He said, where are you? He called out to them and asked for them to respond, even though he knew where they were. And they told him about the sin they had done. And the plan of salvation is revealed then, because what does it say about the serpent? You know, the, uh, the serpent will, will have its head crushed, but the serpent would bruise the heel of the one crushing it. It's talking about the gospel, <coughs> that Jesus would deal with sin, even though it cost him. The plan of salvation revealed right back in the book of Genesis, but it's been revealed time and time and time again and climaxing in Jesus Christ. And so that's why I've uh, selected these two readings today. One is about Moses in the wilderness, where the people of Israel were rebellious against Moses and God. And God's, God made poisonous snakes come into the camp and the people were bitten and died. And many people were bitten and afraid. And so they came to Moses and they made, came to Moses and asked him to intercede before God to take the poisonous snakes away and not let them die. The people were bitten. But why would God be so cruel, we would say, to allow them to be bitten by poisonous snakes? Well, I don't think it's necessarily um, because God was cruel, but as a means to push the people to repentance. Well, that's what we read there in, the, in Numbers, verse 7. Um, I'll go back to that reading. You may want to open your Bibles to make sure that I'm not, I'm not uh, telling you untruths, but I, I wouldn't dare do that. Verse 7 of the reading, The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord, and against you, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make the snake and so on. The serpents were there so that the people would come back to the Lord. They would go on their own way. When they were bitten, they went to say, Lord, uh, Moses, help the Lord to save us. We come back to the Lord. What do we do? And so Moses became the gracious intercessor, even though they had maligned him and spoken badly against him. But then God's grace came into action. He didn't take away the snakes, but he made a means of salvation. He made the bronze serpent on the pole so that all who were able, but only those who chose to do so, could look to the bronze serpent and be healed. And so if they didn't look up at the serpent, believing that God said, if you look up at this serpent and you'll be healed, if they didn't look up, they still died. Because they didn't use faith. They didn't take God at his word. They didn't accept God's grace in action. And so it wasn't the snake that healed, but it was God who healed as a result of the people's expression of real faith. And so when they did look up, those who chose to, they, they received healing and life. And then you go over to the New Testament reading, John chapter 3. Now, remembering that in, in Numbers, God was revealing a start of the understanding of the Gospel. These things that happened with Moses and the snake are a very, very direct parallel to the Gospel of Jesus Christ, because God was revealing that plan and bringing it to, to culmination in Jesus Christ. There in John 3, verses 14 and 21, we read there in that passage that we are condemned already because of sin. Some people think, well, you know, I will get to get to I die, I'll go to heaven, and if I've been good enough or if I haven't been bad, then I will, God will say, come into heaven. Scripture says we're condemned already because of the sinfulness of humanity. We all have sinned. All have sinned. And so we're already under a condemn the condemnation of God, like we've been bitten by the poisonous snakes. We are already facing death, spiritual death. But God provided an intercessor, a mediator, a saviour, a redeemer, Jesus Christ. 
And God's grace is in action in Jesus Christ. Not the serpent held up on the on a stick, but there it says in verse 14 of John 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. As the people look to the snake, we look to Jesus Christ. God's grace in action in Jesus Christ. Not selective. God doesn't say only some people can look. Only some people can look to Jesus. The rest of you, you might want to, but go away. I haven't picked you. God says that his offer is to all. And who, But whoever looks, and only those who look to Jesus Christ, are saved. God calls for response. In faith, look to Jesus on the cross of Calvary and you will be saved, the scripture says. Whoever believes is granted eternal life. Romans 10. 9 and 10. Who can quote those without looking it up? No, I'll let you look. I'll let you go. If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not if you do that, God will think about it. God might have a look to see whether you've been naughty or nice, like at Christmas. No, it says you will be saved. Because you're saying, I am dying, but Jesus provides life. Now what does that all mean for us today? If God's plan of salvation has been from eternity, from before time began, and highlighted in Jesus Christ, who is the fulfilment of God's plan of salvation. What does that mean? Firstly, it means if you do not know Jesus as your personal saviour, then you really need to look to Jesus in faith today. You know, there is a difference between being with Christians, coming to church, being with Christians, and being a Christian. It's a difference. Just going to church, saying, Lord, I did all the right things. I went to church on Sunday and I sang all those praises when Ron led us or someone else led us and I prayed the, pray the prayers and I said the Amen, but I didn't believe. But I was happy to be with the Christians. God will say, well, you didn't accept my son. You didn't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You didn't accept that Jesus died to carry your sins on his back and die for you. So if you do not know Jesus as your personal saviour, then you really should do it today. Because God's plan through eternity has been to save you because of his love for you, because he wants you to be in glory with him for all eternity. You do stand before God condemned because of sin and spiritual rebellion. Ah, oh, I haven't been a bad person, Russell. Well, the scripture says we're all bad because of the presence of sin that that sin separates us from God. But you can choose life by turning towards God by faith in Jesus' actions on the cross. The second application for us today, there are probably many, but I'm going to give three. As Jesus is lifted up on the cross of Calvary, we also need to lift Jesus up for all to see. We need to tell the gospel to all and any, to everyone who is willing to hear. And how do we know whether they're willing to hear unless we try to tell them? We don't wait until they give us an indication that they're willing to hear, but we tell them of the hope that is in us, our love for Jesus Christ. We tell the gospel. We lift Jesus up. So as, Je as Moses was lifted up, so Jesus is lifted up so that he might draw all people to himself. It may seem foolish to many who hear, but the scripture says it is God's power and plan of salvation. You know the story of Ezekiel um, uh, with the watchman on the wall? And Ezekiel says, there's a watchman on the wall, standing guard on the wall. And if he sees the enemy coming, and he says nothing, and the enemy get into the city and kill people, God says, I will demand on that watchman's life. 
the penalty for not telling anyone. But Ezekiel also then says, but if the watchman says, there's an enemy coming, there's an enemy coming, get ready, get ready, get ready, and they do nothing, it's on their own heads, not the watchman's. Do you know any neighbours who don't know the Lord? Do you know any relatives who don't know the Lord? Tell them, lift Jesus higher. You know there are no other messengers today who can tell the gospel. It's up to Christians. Raise Jesus on. The people who have died cannot tell. The people who have not been born cannot tell this generation. It's only those of us who believe and who are alive who can speak to this generation and society. The third application is cherish your own salvation. Live worthy of the gospel. Be thrilled that God has done all this so that you can share all of eternity with him. Don't despise what Jesus has done by bringing him into shame by your actions or your attitudes or your words. Show you are a follower by being worthy of him in all things. Don't cheapen your faith by making little of the opportunities to grow in your faith. Don't cheapen your faith so that the joys of salvation are no longer joys but become the burdens of religious ritual. <clears throat> Keep focused on the God and Saviour of the cross and don't just worship the cross in itself. Don't make praise of Jesus on the cross <coughs> become all it is. But make your praise to God be because of the cross and his action in your life. A sad story in the Old Testament is that many, many years after Moses made this serpent, this bronze serpent, you know, they kept it in the, in the camp with them, all like, like a museum item, you know. This is what Moses did for us, this is what God did for us. But eventually, the people set it up in a temple. And Hezekiah, the king, had to destroy the bronze serpent because people had come to worship the bronze serpent. They were making offerings, burning incense to the bronze serpent. Not to God. Not saying this reminds us of what God has done, but they were worshipping the bronze serpent. So Hezekiah destroyed it. Don't let what should be a reminder of God to you become the God of ritual in itself, the end in itself. Now I don't know you folk, that's why I can say that I don't know whether you are Christian or all of you are Christians or not. But whether you are Christians or not believers, Respond daily, now, today, in faith to Jesus Christ as he has lifted up before you. Anyone watching this video, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you need to do so also. I appeal to you today, believe, lift Jesus high, cherish what God has done for you. God bless you. Thank you.